Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations through which she receives her old tradition of manhood, Ireland through us summons her children to the flag and strikes for her freedom. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Father Brendan Kilcoyne, coming to you from Athenry, County Galway, courtesy of Immaculata Productions. You're very welcome to this podcast, this uh, episode of The Brendan Option, in which I hope to explore just a little bit more our present and likely future situation as Catholic community in Ireland. What do they mean by freedom? And strikes for her freedom. What was that freedom? Do we have it now? To be sure, we've preserved parliamentary democracy. We've preserved many of the best British institutions. Bicameral legislature, the separate independent judiciary and unarmed constabulary. Tremendous achievements. The Irish state achieved a tremendous amount for a people of whom it was never really felt that they were capable of ruling themselves. Never felt by the then rulers. That freedom, do we have it now? Do we still have it? Because we're talking about a hundred years, roughly, roughly a hundred years after the, the conflict generated by 1916. And it's reasonable enough to take stock and ask, where are we now? Because we have a government and a press who are largely in lockstep. There's little or no variety in the Dáil. Uh, the Labour Party seems fairly banjaxed. Sinn Féin seems the main opposition. But many of Sinn Féin's policies, except the strictly economic, seem indistinguishable from the policies of the main closer to right-wing parties, the centre parties, if you like. Certainly Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are nearly impossible to distinguish. Is there freedom with such a limited choice? I mean, that question might reasonably be asked, and people like John Waters are very much exploring it at the moment. Do we actually have the freedom for which so much blood was shed, such dark things happened, such a hard road was walked, the civil war afterwards? Do we have really the freedom that was envisaged? Do we understand what freedom is? Do we understand the price it came at? Does this generation know the price that was paid for freedom? How dirty that fight was, how hard it was. Or do they really think of freedom as, in the words of the song, traveling to Paris in a sports car with the wind blowing in, in her hair. I mean, is that, is that freedom? Some endless horizon. Woody Allen has a film in which he shows the audience and the cast of a film moving in and out of each other's presence, each other's worlds. And the cast, one of the dashing uh, hero of the film, falls in love with a mortal woman. And as he kisses her, he's shocked that the, the light doesn't dim and the scene doesn't fade out. Because, of course, he's a two-dimensional character. Are we beginning to forget, with all the endless recording of everything, with all the social media, are we beginning to forget what it is to live? Which is surely a condition of freedom. I mean, it's a pointless to talk about freedom if we don't talk about reality. I just put that to you. Lately, we did our best under nearly impossible circumstances to do First Communions, and they were done very carefully and very reverently, in some ways more reverent than usual, to be honest with you. You know, the kids just came in one by one with their parents. It was all very, very carefully controlled. And that's how we did it. And I noticed that one parent, I'm sure a good man, I'm sure a very good man, he barely spent any time taking in what was happening. He was so busy trying to film it on his phone. So in the end, my fellow priest had to ask him, did he wish to take communion? Did he wish to receive? Because we were standing there waiting for him and he was filming us. He hadn't put it out of his hand the whole time. I see all these selfies going on and I wonder, are we, do we believe that things are real if they're not on film? In the Gospel today, the Gospel is taken from Matthew 22, and it's, it's, it's a famous Gospel. You know, the God and Caesar Gospel, where the, the Pharisees try to catch Jesus out. Uh, and it's a nice one, you know, it's a nice bit of work. 
I mean, if he says, you know, they ask him, do we have to pay our taxes to Caesar? And he, and he, he realises that they're trying to trap him because if he says, no, don't pay Caesar, they'll go and rat on him to the Roman authorities, that he's a rebel. And if he says, oh, absolutely, pay Caesar, he'll turn a good few of his own people against him because they hate the, the tax collector. So how does he answer that? And of course, the famous answer, it was a classic Roman definition of justice. I think it was Ulpian's definition of justice, but I'm not suggesting that's the one that the Son of God is quoting. Ulpian said, uh, justice is the constant and perpetual will to give to each his own. It's a very famous definition by a Roman jurist of justice. The constant and perpetual will to give to each his own. And Jesus simply says, look, you be fair, be just. Give to Caesar what's coming to Caesar. Eh? Caesar's face is on the coins. You give to Caesar what's coming to Caesar, but you give to God what's due to God. And the distinction of that, that's the art of living as a believer in God. See, how far can you obey Caesar? Because surely a Catholic should be an excellent citizen. And yet, you know, what if the laws are unjust? I mean, the state in this country does absolutely fantastic things. The state that was founded in the freedom that was fought for in 1916, proclaimed from the steps of the GPO, really from the portico of the GPO. It does wonderful things. I mean, you know, the roads we use, unarmed police forces, civilised policing, um, maybe not enough of it, but that's not the police's fault. Um, I recently enjoyed the, the hospitals, all right, I know there's a delay and all that kind of thing, but when you get into them, they're fantastic, absolutely fantastic. There's a lot of good stuff going on in this country, there are tremendous achievements by the state, and yet there is tremendous evil also being done by the state, because it now facilitates and indeed carries out, effectively, abortion. And abortion is a, a, an evil and wicked practice. It's barbarous. It's cruel. It's, it's an evil and pagan practice. It's no better than infanticide. And in fact, it is infanticide. And so where are we here? Where are we in this state? Because a nation and a state aren't the same thing. Remember that. In 1916, what you had was a nation saying, we want a state. And they would have seen themselves as merely the latest in a long line of Irish men and women who had insisted, we want a state for our nation. We want a political, legal, juridic expression, a parliamentary expression. We wish to conduct our own affairs. We do not wish to be ruled by foreigners. No disrespect to foreigners, certainly no disrespect to the English who, from whom we got so much. But we simply did, we wished to conduct our own business. We didn't wish to be ruled by them anymore. We hadn't wished to be ruled by them for some time. And so we got a state. 1948, the Jews got a state, which they hadn't had, I don't know, I suppose, arguably since the, well, the fall of the temple, anyway, you could say, if you, if you call Her the rule of Herod a state. I don't think you could really say they had a state under the Romans. I mean, you couldn't really. Herod, he didn't have any great purchase, really. He didn't command any huge respect with the Jews. So a nation may not have a state, but all nations, very understandably, at least consider having a state and most wish to have a state. You even see in Canadian history, the Quebecois uh, had a referendum as late as, was it 1980? About their independence and they decided to stay in Canada. And so we acquired a state. Well, after a fashion, the six counties remained uh, under the rule of the United Kingdom, but you know, we, the greater part of the Irish people acquired a state. For a long time that state was Catholic, and so we Irish Catholics, we saw ourselves as the Irish people. And to an extent, to a large extent, we were. Now that was very hurtful for the Protestant minority here. That was very hurtful for them. But that was certainly the way we saw it. And that was the way it was perceived. To be Irish and a loyal Irish citizen of the Irish state, you were typically Catholic as well. And now that has changed. And Irish Catholics uh, are no longer the nation at prayer. So we, we no longer have a state in that sense, and yet we are still citizens of a state. We still have Caesar. We still deal in the coins that bear his image. We use his roads. We are treated in his hospitals. We, we pay him taxes. Very significant. We hand over our, our money to be used for good and also to be used for evil. Taxpayers' money is being used to fund abortion. It may shortly be used to fund euthanasia, for all we know. 
So how, how do we conduct ourselves? How, the Pharisees weren't the worst. They're whipped. They're hammered by Jesus. He beats them with fists, so to speak. Not because they're so far from the mark, but because they're so near the mark. These are fine people, and there they are trying to catch out the Messiah. They, they can't see the wood for the trees. And so we ask them, is it permissible to pay to Caesar? A lot of Catholics are asking now, is this our country? For a while after the abortion referendum, I found it, you know, I found it kind of hard to see the flag as my own for a while. And then it occurred to me, you know, for many years, people who didn't agree with me had to see that flag as their own. And yet they were Irish and I'm Irish. And now they're on top and the likes of me are, you know, sort of elbowed away from the fire. And, well, we had our feet in it for long enough and now we have to get used to this. So how do we do this? To what extent is it permissible to pay to Caesar? I'm asking this question, you know, it's a rhetorical question because I'm, I'm really making a point is we have to start sorting this out because, I mean, now we're, our churches are closed and because Caesar is trying to do his job. I, whether you agree with the state or not, and these are impossible calls, my God, like, you know, those are awful calls to make. I mean, the Taoiseach and, and the cabinet, really, they're like generals in an army, no matter what decision they make, people die. On the one hand, people's livelihoods are ruined. On the other hand, people will be dying in, in, in ICUs. I mean, I, how do you do this? Was Sweden right? I don't know. Are you willing to achieve herd immunity at ethical cost? I don't. It wasn't as high as, as people thought it would be, but it was still, it was still high. It was still real. Those were, those were real people who died. I don't know. That needs a way more thought, but I do know that those questions need to be actively considered, debated and discussed among us now, because this is becoming acute. I mean, what if the churches keep being closed? Let's be clear, I'm a parish priest in Galway and I'm sitting in the parish house and my church is across the road and it's closed. Uh, it's not closed during the day, it's open and there's adoration all day. Thanks to our wonderful parishioners as well, like who man the adoration. But I mean, I said Mass today, I said Mass last night in churches that were almost completely empty. There was a parishioner serving and yeah, that was pretty much it really. How long can we go on like this? I mean, we're clearly not regarded, Mass isn't regarded as essential. It's regarded as being, it's treated with a degree of respect, all right. Religion does get mentioned, fine. And we'll probably continue to get that bit of tattered, you know, respect. Like a sort of a fine old threadbare carpet. You know, we'll be kept, not thrown out. Because we still have a bit of touch of the master's hand. We still have that bit of elegance to us. A bit of manky elegance. But we don't, we don't figure anymore, really. And mass isn't regarded as essential. But for us, it's essential. Is it essential for the survival of the church? No, it's not, because we know from places in which the church was savagely persecuted. And we often forget, we think of Russia, we think of Nazi Germany, we think of these places. But in fact, to one extent or another, the church was, even in, in Russia, even in the Gulag, I mean, that Father Chizek talks about saying mass just, just with the, the minimum of, of opportunity, like, you know, in the Gulag. He spent years in the Gulag, the American priest. But, I mean, what about feudal Japan? You know that film Silence? Uh, I mean, the Tokugawa, that dynasty that took over, kicked the Jesuits out, kicked all the foreigners out, pretty much sealed off the country for hundreds of years. That dynasty conducted a savage, thorough, highly intelligent persecution. And yet, when uh, the Americans forced the opening up of Japan again in the 19th century, Commodore Perry, and Japan reluctantly opened to foreign trade, it was discovered, gradually, that there were still Catholics in Japan, without Mass or sacraments. So I say the Church can survive I, I, in a certain place without Mass, but it is deformed. It can survive deformed. And survival is better than the opposite. It can drag along. It can haul itself quasimodically along uh, through the shadows of the cathedral of our present situation, shambling around, ringing the bells. It can do that. But it's not good that that should go on for too long because it is a deformation. It is a, a horribly crippled situation. 
So on the one hand, I say, don't be precious about this because we can survive without the sacraments. On the other hand, it won't be a great level of survival, but we'll survive. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, is it necessary that we endure this? And secondly, if it's not, what should we do about it? This is an important question. We have to ask ourselves, also as citizens, as a public service, we have to ask ourselves, is it to the good of our country that a major religion allows itself, for whatever good reasons and through no direct malice, to be gradually strangled of air? Is that for the good of our democracy? Is that the freedom the 1916 men died for? Because I I would make the point to you here, And this country is going to have to make its peace with this. It has moved away from Catholicism, yet it has a huge debt to Catholicism. The rosary was recited continuously in the GPO during the Rising. It was, in a sense, this may offend some Protestants if they're listening, because Protestants were involved, but it was essentially and predominantly a Catholic Irish revolt. Although Irish Republicanism was not originally mainly Catholic in its leadership, if you go back to Wolf Tone, the United Irishmen, and so on. So it was intensely Catholic in its conception. I would put it to you also that it was a revolt of the oppressed. Not necessarily, I'm not simplifying this in terms of, the English weren't the worst. But still, it was, it was an oppression. It was an oppression to take away freedom to express one's culture. It was taken from the, well, controversially, you're not allowed now to like Afrikaners. For a long time, it's not permitted to like Afrikaners because a spitting image, as one said, I never met a nice South African. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is, but that was the way the Afrikaners were treated. Their language, there was a major attempt to stamp out their language. It was very much similar to the attempt to stamp out Irish. And if you look into the life of the, of the Cajun people, Uh, this former Acadian peoples who were forcibly transplanted in the late 18th century, around the time many Catholic Irish had to flee the north because of pogroms. They were forcibly expelled from crown territories because they wouldn't swear allegiance to the British crown. They were loyal to the French crown and they ended up, many of them, going to Louisiana. And there are Cajun people now who will tell you that they remember being very badly treated in school back in the 1940s for speaking French. There are various ways to oppress people, and we were oppressed. I'm sorry, but we were. Were we the most oppressed country ever? No. But we felt we had to fight for our freedom. As Pierce said, we felt furthermore that we could not have it said to our children, you were given your freedom. You were manumitted like a slave. You were emancipated. No, Pierce said, we must take our freedom for the sake of our children. They must be able to say, our ancestors gave us our freedom, not our masters. You see this? So I keep harping on this freedom. And now here we are, and we're Irish Catholics. And in the country we shaped, we are now a minority. Are we an oppressed minority? The jury's out on that, but I don't like what I smell on the wind. Now, the jury's out. If you were to take me on an argument, if I said we were oppressed, if I said that Irish Catholics now are, we're like, we're the Cajuns in a new, in a revolutionary country, in a country that fought for its freedom. You might feel that I was very much overstating the case. I wonder if in 10 years' time, if we sat down to talk, you would still feel, if we were both still in it, that I was overstating the case, because I see this. I don't see the future going well for us here. And yet we have to obey the state. We have to obey the state in all things that, are, that do not offend God. Okay, to put it as, as, as basically as simply as possible. So what happens if we keep being deprived of the sacraments in the interests of public health? And the answer, the, the answer to that is I don't know. And secondly, the answer to it is that as a responsible citizen and as a timid little petty bourgeois and lastly as a practicing and highly professional coward i don't my head caves in wanting to think about it because i'm no rebel but i don't know where we're going here and it's going to be a problem very soon
It's going to be a problem very soon for the, because the de deprivation of the sacraments will start to cripple us as a church. Will we survive? Yes. Do you want to survive looking like Quasimodo in the ecclesial sense? Okay, he had to live too, but no, I don't particularly want, you know, my church to look like Quasimodo, like a corporate Quasimodo, no. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying to you here, we're in this situation. Now, we, if you're a Catholic who's very invested and you're, you know, you have a whole load of middle class friends and you're, you're very invested in all of that, I, I mean, naturally you're going to, I'm not judging you, I'm not judging you, okay. Naturally you're going to want to soften this and find a way out of this so that we stay being the model prisoner, which is what we are. Didn't Greece call Ireland the model prisoner after we took our medicine uh, after the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the 2008 thing and we ended up carrying this massive amount of debt for a whole load of bondholders who under normal rules would have lost their investment? I mean, we were called, the, the, I think it was the Greek finance minister, I think, who referred to us as the, as the model prisoner in the European Union. Is that what Irish Catholics are going to be now, the model prisoner? Because we, we just roll over no matter what's said to us. You know, do this, do that, do the other, and we just do it. I wonder at what stage we'll find ourselves forced to go looking around for the GPO. And I don't mean to buy stamps. Or will it happen? I don't want to do it. I, I will be like, in the words of Yeats, slouching towards Bethlehem to be born. I don't want to do it. I would drag my feet. I, I, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight. I've always been fascinated by military history. I'm fascinated by the... I have a nerdish interest in it. And I've always been afraid of getting shot. Okay, so you go figure. So, I'm an armchair general. I, I, I don't want this to happen. I'm a whiskey priest. I don't want to die for the faith. I don't want to go to jail. I don't even want to get fined. Are made in Egypt of. I have a peasant terror of me name in the paper, of being made a fool of and the whole parish laughing at me. Well, probably my whole parish is laughing at me, but for a different reason. I don't want this. And I'm not saying we're in feudal Japan or anything like that, but I'm just saying, I mean, I'm looking at the stuff now that's happening in the States. I'm looking at how far highly respected corporations and news agencies seem to be willing to go when the news doesn't suit them. And I'm, I'm starting to feel my feet very cold. Crikey. <laughs> I don't know what to say to you. I mean, did you see what's going on there with that whole, with that whole Ukrainian stuff and with the way, the, the whole debate now as to, as to how the social media um, outlets behaved, the corporations behaved. I, all, look, look, I, I, I'm not going to go into it in any detail. I'm not even qualified to go into it in any detail. I'm telling you, we are in shark-infested waters. And, and I don't particularly want to end up on the menu. So how do we do this? How do we give to each his own? How do we give to God the things of God and to Caesar the things of Caesar? Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is we need, I've said this a hundred times before. You're sick of listening to me say it. Brace yourself. Reach for the popcorn because I'm going to say it again. We need to get down off our high horse and get used to the sewer because that's where we are. So stop having such notions, you rad cats, trad cats, medge heads, and all you other type of cats out there, including you compromising cats, bourgeois cats, middle class cats, rich cats. We need to get down off our high horse. We don't belong here anymore. And yet we are of Ireland. In the words again of Yeats, I am of Ireland. I think he was quoting a medieval gloss. I am of Ireland and the holy land of Ireland. We are of Ireland and the holy land of Ireland. So how do we make a life for ourselves? I'm telling you, the first thing to do will be the first, uh, w one of the obvious and first conditions of freedom is the acceptance of reality and the willingness to engage with reality and with the fact that no matter what your dreams, the world is hard all the way through. All the way through. It is as hard as the cross on which Christ was crucified. And so we, we have to consider, reflect and decide on how we are going to function as church in relation to Caesar, in relation to this society. Serve it, love it 
and yet be true to ourselves, to be Christ in this society. And I put it to you that Pope Francis is on to something here when he is continually pressing on the thing. All right, some people may not like the way he says it, and humanly maybe, who knows, maybe there was the odd misjudgment in how things were said. I don't know. I do know is that we have to get down off our high horse. We have to stop becoming obsessed with preserving the status quo. We have to move away, as others are saying, from maintenance ministry. We have to become much more radical. We have to become red cats, much more radical in terms of the solutions we envisage. If the parish is no longer a viable entity, move away from the parish. Accept the fact that the more dynamic parishes will now attract parishioners from other parishes and maybe some parishes will just quite naturally die. And if we have to live with that, we have to live with that. Teach our kids to think. If a teacher, if a Catholic teacher has to get down on his or her knees in the classroom and say, if you won't believe in God, will you at least think for yourself? For goodness sake, don't give up the faith that you have hardly understood and walk out the door and believe the first nonsense that's poured into your head. But thinking is hard work. Thinking is skilled work. Thinking is a tradesman's work. And here I come to it. Here I come to the onion. Here I come to the bit. Here I come to the little clove of garlic at the centre of this, this dish. The Pharisees who come to Jesus, and Jesus himself, what class did they come from? Unlike the Sadducees, they didn't come from the upper classes, the priestly classes. No, no. The Pharisees, for the most part, scholars determine, were from the artisan class. They were mostly artisans. Remember, Paul was a tent maker, and Paul was a Pharisee. They were mostly artisans. And remember that Jesus himself, humanly, comes from the same class. Joseph was technon. He was a small builder. Or carpenter. They, they say carpenter doesn't fully translate that. He kind of probably built more in stone than in wood. But anyway, he was a small builder. That's the class the Pharisees come from. That's the class Jesus comes from. The Pharisees are enormously prestigious in their society. Josephus tells us, well... If you want to get into this, there's a problem with believing everything Flavius Josephus says because he has his own agenda, but he's a huge source. And Josephus would say that really even the priests in the temple were afraid to do things in a way that didn't please the Pharisees because the people thought so highly of them. So in taking them on, Jesus is showing enormous courage, but he's also, it must have been breaking his heart. Because he's taking on his own crowd. These are the finest of people and they're making a hash of it. They're the finest of people. Now I put it to you that a lot of Catholics are going to have to settle. If they're serious about sticking with their faith for being a bit poorer than maybe their talents would indicate or allow. We're going to have to settle for, at least metaphorically, not belonging to the upper classes. Now, we started out like this. You may remember that Christianity was a proscribed religion for 300 years. That's an awfully long time until the conversion of Constantine. And Caesar now is unconverted. The Caesar under whom we, by whom we are ruled and legitimately ruled, is a pagan. I'm not being insulting. I'm just saying it. I mean, you can find another word for it if you like. You can call him Seamus. I don't know. You do what you like. So th- there's no Constantine on the horizon. There won't be, I suspect, for quite a long time. So how do we deal with Caesar? I put it to you, we are going to have to be very realistic if we want to stay free. We are going to have to keep away from power, and it might do us no harm anyway. I have long held the view, I've said it before, I've long held the view that it's by now increasingly difficult for a devout Catholic, for a faithful Catholic, to serve in politics over the level of a member of parliament and I wonder whether that's even possible anymore. Now some of you are going to get mad with me about that and maybe I'm wrong, how do I know? But let's just take this particular weasel and throw him into the chicken coop, shall we? Let's just see what happens here. I just put that to you, I don't think this is possible anymore. I would question as to whether as to whether a devout Catholic can serve in the highest levels of the civil service anymore or will even be allowed to. I would question as to whether a devout Catholic, a faithful Catholic, can hope to get to the height of anything anymore. I think we're going to have to settle for 
what we would now call the, and for a long time would have called the lower middle classes at best. I don't know. Maybe we can make money in business still. Fair enough. If we can, that's that's super. But I would just ask these questions. But I would point out to you that the Pharisees became outstanding leaders of their religion and their people from a position of social and economic modesty. And I would point out to you that the Son of God is incarnate and born into that social class. I would just make that point. Mary Kenny once, she once commented that she was looking down a list of what priests do when they leave the priesthood. And they were all, they were very good jobs, you know. They, and they were all kind of related. They were teachers and educators and uh, psychologists and, and social workers and you name it. And she said, hmm, not too many fishermen or carpenters there. And you know, it stung. I left the seminary at one stage and I went teaching. I mean, it, it stung. So we're going to, have to look at all of this. Now, I would point out to you that the situation is not as hopeless as you may think. Because we are in the middle of a slave revolt. Va pensiero. Huh? You, know, you, you know that? Isn't that from Nabucco? Va pensiero, the famous, the, sl the slaves chorus, magnificent. Is that Verdi? It's Verdi, I think. It's famous. It was the anthem, just to uh, give you confidence in me, it was the anthem for a long time of the Italian Communist Party. Va pensiero. And it's the, it's the song of the Hebrew slaves. We're in the middle of a global slave revolt. And that was what a certain Belfast newspaper actually called the 1916 Rebellion. They used that term, a slave revolt. And I put it to you that, all right, I'm not making an argument for him. I know he's a complex character and a complex political phenomenon. But I put it to you that the election of Donald Trump was a slave revolt. Now, I, I'm offending everybody here because the people who voted for him will be annoyed at being called slaves. <laughs> I, don't, I, I think I've managed to offend everyone, which is quite an achievement. But I put it to you that Brexit is a slave revolt. And I'm telling you there are going to be a lot more of them. There are going to be a lot more of them. When a million people turned out on the streets, orchestrated as far as I know by the Catholic Church in France, which everyone thought was dead, against the machinations of François Hollande to bring in gay marriage, when the manif, the manifestation, the, the, a million people turned out in the demonstration. That's a slave revolt. Va pensiero. I think that should be our new anthem. And it's gorgeous. So maybe this is our time, you dispossessed rad cats, trad cats, medge heads, all you wandering believers. Maybe this is our time. Maybe I'm being too gloomy here. Maybe there are possibilities in this new dispensation we're in. And what else is Pope Francis telling us to do? He's telling us, get back to what we should be at anyway. Start working again with the poor. I would put it to you, I know the church is doing this already, but we should be doing it radically. We should be working with the dispossessed. We should put all our attention back again into the poor. Listen to me. I've come to the sneaking conclusion that maybe, I mean, inevitably, we're going to have to give up most of our schools anyway. I think that's obvious. Why don't we just emphatically give up? And I invite the religious orders to join me in this. I, I'd love to hear what they have to say on this. Why don't we give up our most prestigious schools? Why don't we give up all of the exclusive schools? And why don't we, a bit like the CFRs, you know, the, the, the Franciscans of the Renewal, Benedict Rochelle's gang, you know, the, the hairy friars, as I like to call them. I don't think they like it. They're down in Limerick. They're up in Derry. I think those are their two bases. And then you've got their sisters as well. But the sisters aren't, aren't hairy friars, OK? Yeah, no, 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 no. So maybe their idea is what we should look at. You know, they move into the toughest areas. And when those areas start to gentrify and do well, they're obliged, as far as I know, to move on. Maybe we should just do that. Maybe we should just settle for the periphery. Maybe we should be settling in. Maybe that's how we function here. And that's how we deal with Caesar. Is to have the toughness of the streets. Do you know what I'm proposing here? It's a very, very new concept. Now, this is very radical, OK, very revolutionary. So please, if you're going to have a heart attack, get to a safe place. 
I'm proposing chav cats. You know the chavs? Yeah, I chav cats. So I don't know, maybe the bishops should go in to negotiate with the government wearing tracksuits and bling. They won't have to go too far for the bling because in fairness, a bishop has to wear a ring, okay? He has to wear a ring and he has to wear a pectoral cross. And he could wear that over, I don't know, a purple tracksuit tucked in at the bottoms into, in, into his socks. Okay, you think I'm being disrespectful now. I, I'm trying to entertain you a bit. But it's redentum di cereverum, as the, as the Romans used to say. It's, it's, it's to speak the truth laughingly. I'm making a serious point. We're going to have to abandon dignity. And I'm going to quote that character at the beginning of Quentin Tarantino's film, Inglorious Bastards. Because the first ha- half hour of that is a tremendous study of tension, produced by the most ludicrous means in, in some cases. But it's it's just a magnificent study of tension where the SS officer is in the home of the French farmer who's hiding Jews under his floorboards. And he engages in this long, apparently pointless philosophical musing, which creates a tremendous sense of foreboding. And he says, you know, do you know why they have me in this job? Do you know why they call me the Jew hunter? It's because I know what feats people are capable of when once they have abandoned dignity. It's a great point. That is a great point. I, I, I wonder if what's not holding us back here is our lace curtain Irish Catholicism, is the hard-won respectability which we now have to abandon, where our beliefs are ridiculed, where we are not respected. And maybe we should take a 1916 approach and say, Don't worry now, just in case the guards are at my door tomorrow, I am not advocating armed rebellion. I am advocating intellectually and spiritually armed rebellion. So go back to our Catholic schools. What should we, we we go to the toughest areas, we we, we take the toughest schools, we start again, and what are we teaching the kids to do? Let me tell you what we're teaching the kids to do. And we'll take your kid even if you're not a Catholic, right? And you don't mind your kid, you know, wearing about 15 rosary beads around his neck and lashing holy water at you every time you turn around in the house. No, I'm joking. Yeah, we'll take your kid. But don't blame us later. Because you know what we're going to teach your kid to do? We're not going to brainwash your kid. We're not going to brainwash your kid into being Catholic. Because you can't brainwash somebody into being a Catholic. Because then it's not a human act. A human act must contain also the minimum of freedom in which that act can be placed as a human being. So we don't believe that you can force somebody to be a Catholic. And don't come at me about the Inquisition. Okay, don't start that crap because the Inquisition was much more complex than that. We can talk about that another day. We don't believe you can be forced to be a Catholic. We don't believe a brainwashed Catholic is a Catholic at all. I'll tell you what we teach your kid to do, but you mightn't like it when he comes home in the evening or she. We'll teach them how to think. We'll teach them how we'll get them ready for freedom. And I don't know if you can handle that. Right? Let me quote another of my favourite cinematic quotations. The incomparable Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men. You can't handle the truth. And that's what the Catholic Church is saying to the world and it's saying to you. And we're tattered and disreputable and we're broken down by our own faults. And here we are and we're now sucking up to a government that probably despises us and maybe has a point. And the sucking up is going to get us nowhere because we're 2,000 years old and we know where sucking up gets you, which is, sorry, duh, nowhere. And you can't handle the truth because that's the one thing we have. We have the truth. You send your kid to a Catholic school and we're going to turn them into a knacker. We're going to turn them into a chav. We're going to turn them into an intellectual bowsy. In the phrase coined by William Foote White, the the American sociologist, we're going to introduce them to intellectual and spiritual street corner society. I mean, you are going to be shocked by the creature that comes back to you. So don't send your kids to a Catholic school. Not because they'll be brainwashed. You're the one that's brainwashed. But because your kid is going to come back a free man or a woman. And I don't think you can handle it. So when we end up with a few schools in the whole country, I'm telling everyone listen to the podcast, 
You better keep away from them, keep your kids out of them, because they will be teaching people to be briars, to be awkward, to be curious, to be questioning. We're going to raise intellectual and spiritual wolf cubs, and we're going to teach them to hunt. Now, unless you can come up with a lot of meat on the table, I'd suggest you don't need a wolf in your house. That's what we're going to be doing. That's how we're going to contribute to this society. And that's how we're going to give to Caesar what is due to Caesar. Caesar tells us that Caesar believes in freedom and inclusiveness. We're going to include your ass real good. We're going to give you all the inclusivity you need. We're going to include you in heaven. We're going to teach you the bedrock of freedom, which is reality, which is an eye washed clean of BS, which looks clearly at the world and can see it and knows how to deal with it and engage with it and how to stand before it. We're going to educate you for freedom. This is our GPO and we are going to wrap the green flag round us and strike for her freedom, as the proclamation said. Pope Francis said, never give money to a poor man without looking him in the eye. It's a very good point. I've often done it. I've given money to, to a beggar and I've just given it an embarrassment and walked along. I have, I don't, I'm afraid to look at them. I'm afraid to engage with them. You would know what they'd ask you. You wouldn't know. You might be tempted to give them more. And because I'm, I'm cowardly and I'm mean, I dodge it. We're going to have to learn to look the poor in the eye. And remember that the greatest poverty existing in this country at the moment is spiritual poverty. And I'm afraid intellectual poverty is coming up hard behind it. I'm enjoying at the moment. It's just, again, I like military history, but it's, a, again, a little bit... I don't know much about it. It's a little bit of a hobby. It, just reading uh, some archaeology and reading... I'm, I'm, I'm just very interested in the, in the Middle Ages. We had a great Middle Age, you know. It was a good time for us. I'm very interested in, in just Ireland's archaeology and, and in medieval archaeology. I'm ministering in a very historic town, Athenry. It's a medieval Anglo-Norman town founded by the de Birminghams. They're outside Galway. It's a very, very prosperous town for several centuries. I imagine Galway probably occluded it, sort of overshadowed it after that. But one of the things I notice with some of these young archaeologists is they're doing articles, very learned articles on, let's say, oh, I don't know, uh, the School of the West, let's say, the famous anonymous group of Masons whose work seems to show up in several different medieval churches in, in the west of Ireland. Or it's on, oh, I don't know, Sheila and the gigs or, or grotesques or gargoyles or, oh, East Windows, whatever you're having. Okay, any of these, you know, these scholarly articles tend to be very precise, necessarily very narrow. But one thing I notice is some of these young archaeologists, they're worn out trying to sort of, I feel sort of brush past the theology that's being expressed in the stone. They're looking for pagan explanations, for secular explanations, for almost any explanation except the obvious explanation is that the building was built by believers. Oh, well, yeah, they, I mean, the church was built like that for reasons of prestige. Fine, like. It was built like that in competition with other believers. I <laughs> think they were building a better church. The key point is that they were believers. I noticed this going on a lot. And I'm telling you, there's, there's an intellectual poverty for all their learning. You can have all the money in the world and be a poor man or woman. You can have all the learning in the world and know nothing. A professor of mine used to like to quote Charles de Gaulle, the French president, the great soldier. And apparently de Gaulle was talking to somebody in Paris one day. He was out of power and he, you know, he wasn't surrounded by guards and everything. He's just talking to somebody on the street. They were near the, uh, near the Sorbonne. And a professor, uh, you know, a famous professor, went past with his head in the air. And de Gaulle said to his friend, de Gaulle was a very intellectual man, he said to his friend, he said, you see that man, he said, he knows everything, therefore he knows nothing. I'm afraid there's not just spiritual poverty, but there's a lot of intellectual poverty. But look, your eyes are narrowing now and you're going to say, ah, there he goes, 
you know, there he goes. He's talking about going back into, oh, you know, kick some spiritual ass here, you know, get back into the poor areas, back into the poor schools. And now he's going, oh, well, there's a lot of intellectual poverty too. So maybe we, maybe we should stay in the universities after all. Maybe we should just talk to the rich because they're so spiritually poor. No, I'm not saying that. But you're dead right. I'd try it if I thought I'd get away with it. No. We have to go back to the poor. And we have to spend quite a bit of time there. We'll betray them again, as we did before and as we always do. But we won't betray them completely, and we never did. The poor are closest to God. I'm not saying they're nice. I suspect some of them are just as nasty as we are. But they're closest to God. We need to be rediscovering that vocation. We need to be rediscovering our Cajun, our Irish Catholic, our Afrikaner, our American Black, our oppressed roots. Does this make sense? We need to be discovering ourselves as, as marginals. There's an awful lot you can learn there. Cromwell said that the Catholics of Ireland could go to hell or to Connacht because there was very little in Connacht. Let me tell you as a Connacht man that bogs are very interesting places. The margins are interesting. The marchlands are interesting. The periphery is interesting. There's a lot you can learn there. Let's go back there. I was very struck in the Holy Land by how utterly empty the desert is. It's something that a European finds hard to envisage. There's nothing out there except sand that you can see. That's where we need to go back to. And you know, the Irish used to call, and it's still there in some village names to this day, they used to call a holy place or a place where there was a hermit or an anchorite. They used to call a place of retreat, uh, some monasteries. They used to call them Jishirt, which comes from the same word, a desert. Desert or D. It's a Jishirt. I'm inviting you back into the Jishirt with no enthusiasm, but with absolute conviction. Right? You get both of those. It's a very Irish invitation. You're invited to a party in my house without any enthusiasm, but with absolute conviction that you should attend. I invite you to this. And I'm saying to you that we chavcats will put up for the moment, for the moment, with being deprived of the Eucharist. But don't push your luck. We come from fighting stock. Just don't push your luck. Okay, for the moment. But we need the Eucharist. Ireland through us summons her children to the flag and strikes for freedom. Freedom's a hard place, but it's a glorious place. Let's live large in Texas, as they say. Let's live free. Irish and Catholic and free. St. Brendan, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.